So it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Naya Sekri, who's a consultant at Barts Hospital, who's going to go through the treatment options in myocarditis. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Perry, for the invitation. Um, so um, Sam's very nicely um, taken you through the causes of myocarditis, uh, alluding to the fact that it's just not ACS type, but you have a varied presentation and you need to keep your suspicion index quite high. Now, I'm putting this list here, but when you have these causes, he's also mentioned you need to think about etiology, and this is just one example of an exhausted list that you need to be aware of. So the focus of my talk here is going to be um, taking you through some real cases, um, um, also what literature exists and how we manage them, and you can make up your own mind by the end of the talk as to how you want to progress your further careers, because I think there's a lot that needs to be done in this field. Um, and in case some of you are not aware of this uh, position paper from the ESC, I would urge you to read that. It's a quite a good read and um, a valuable source of information. So studies have shown um, that myocarditis is common. About 40% of cases will just resolve spontaneously. Uh, and I think that's something that most people just, just, just remember and forget the rest. Uh, and the, these people who will resolve are mostly the ones who've got preserved ventricle systolic function and minimal symptoms. However, um, cases can be of different types, and I'm going to take you through this one common patient. Um, he's a 17-year-old boy who presented with prodromal symptoms, flu-like, had chest tightness on and off for about three days, um, no other systemic uh, significant history. His ECG uh, showed ST elevation and his troponin was elevated. He was brought to our heart attack center, even though he was 17, because of that ECG that triggered off the pathway for the primary PCI. Fortunately, um, the, the resident who was there was somebody with a bigger thinking hat on rather than just coronaries, paused to think, took a bit of systemic history, and this patient had been given dual antiplatelet but didn't really enter the cath lab, was taken, myocarditis was thought of, um, and if you look, the ventricular function was preserved. Sorry, that image just got cut off on the screen. And uh, he went into the scanner the next day, and what this is showing you is as, so we see acute signal on T2 mapping, which is uh, on T2 stir imaging, which tells you that there is acute inflammation or edema, a surrogate marker. Late enhancement shows you this extensive subepicardial late gadolinium enhancement, and you can also see that in the uh, two chamber views, um, similarly co-localized increased edema in areas where there is subepicardial late enhancement. So we were, ha we were happy, we made a decision, the ventricle function was preserved. Um, he was clinically well, his inflammatory markers were normal. We chose to manage him by checking his troponins daily, um, doing a daily ECG, making sure there was no evolution of conduction disease. Um, he had ramipril and bisoprolol initiated, and after day five, things settled down, he felt well, he was sent home, and we arranged for a repeat CMR scan in about six to eight weeks' time to see how he got on. And repeat imaging shows, again, that the, as you can see, um, there was intense edema on the initial scan, but that had resolved. There was no increased signal, and, uh, and you can see uh, things were getting better. Um, so the, the, there is no real guideline as to say how you should manage this group of patients who come in with florid symptoms, um, worrying um, signs on their investigations, um, but sort of settle down. And the standard guideline is that you treat them as per the heart failure guidelines, and if their LV function is very severe, then you manage them just like you would manage a heart failure patient. Um, Nobody knows how long you should treat them with ACE inhibitors or bisoprolol. Our tendency or our practice is to monitor them, and if the ventricular function completely resolves, the patient's completely asymptomatic, then we start weaning off the therapy that could be in months or years of follow-up. 
the guideline, the ESC guideline recommends, okay, you must follow these patients up. How often do you need to see them? Your waiting lists in clinic are already clogging up. Um, so again, our practice is to see how the patient is clinically stable, ventricular function has resolved, you've got no obvious concerns of ongoing inflammation, and following that, in a few cases, we'll send them, um, we'll discharge them in about a couple of years' time, uh, but again, we make a case-by-case -case discussion. Worryingly, you, if you go through other literature, you'll find that myocarditis can also present with sudden cardiac death, and Sam's very nicely shown that data. Uh, and that depends on which series you look at. So some will say only about 2%, and there'll be those who go up to 42%. And you often see DCMs, so were these cases of acute myocarditis, which just carried on and came up as dilated cardiomyopathy, or were these just um, some other cause in heterocardic conditions? Um, I'm going to take you through now some more cases, trying to um, perhaps cover some different um, etiologies as you might come across in your clinical practice. So from a simple benign presentation, we move on to somebody with more fulminant uh, systemic symptoms. So this was a 17-year-old girl who presented with chest pain fever, high inflammatory markers, Troponin was significantly elevated, which is why she was put on CCU um, in the DG District General Hospital. Her ECG was normal, echo down at the bedside. They thought the LV was moderately impaired. And she continued to have symptoms. Because the troponin was elevated, she was transferred to the, um, to the tertiary center. And she had ongoing chest pain on admission. She went into respiratory distress and had to be ventilated. So the working diagnosis with this background was, oh, it's septic shock, and she's got myocardial compromise, something that we know can happen. So she was seen by the intensivist, given a domestos of um, antimicrobials in, um, after taking advice from the infectious diseases doctors. There was nothing, um, and they also gave her hydrocortisone um, just because she was so unwell, some diuretics, that she didn't require much anotropic support and she was extubated within 12 hours. She comes back to our CCU, we take some more history and she says, I've had six weeks ago, I noticed a lump in my neck, I went to my GP, the GP gave me some amoxicillin, uh, two weeks later I had arthralgias and um, myalgias, intermittent rash, no travel history, nothing else. Any takers for diagnosis? So I thought the same, I thought very good. I thought, oh, it's a classic case, EMV, that's it, we've nailed it. Um, and um, so we touched base with our, um, but we were a center, we thought we need to know why the heart was so affected. Could this be a first case of infectious mononucleosis? Um, and uh, we put an MR scanner, she was hemodynamic stable at the time. And this was to confirm, yes, she has got uh, myocardial uh, involvement, and as shown by the arrows, you can see there's subepicardial delayed gadolinium enhancement. The ventricular function at this time was around 40-45%. Um, and this is what happened. She had a few more runs of non-sustained VT. Um, we uh, put on some beta blockers, and um, I hope this comes up quite right. This, this kind of rash came on, something that she'd experienced, she said, in the two weeks prior to coming into hospital. And... Um, that's her temperature chart. Um, so you can see she gets spikes of temperature, but the temperature dips down as well as below normal. Any clues? I didn't know what this was happening, but anybody, any takers? Right, um, so um, a, my colleague who was on call um, texted me this picture and said, um, I'm gonna do a TOE, I think she's got infective endocarditis. Couldn't hear any murmur. And I didn't get pictures, but the TOE was blameless. Um, again, we didn't know, so we, we were talking about viruses, all the other pathologies, so we sent off an exhaustive screen, and this time we were liaising with a virologist and the infectious diseases. So I've just put this busy panel here, but just to tell you, blood cultures, septic screen was negative, um, extensive virology, which was coming back to us, everything was negative. Um, then autoimmune serology was negative, she was, she was Afro-Caribbean, so the they thought it could be SLE or some sort of an autoimmune disorder. CK, thyroid function, nothing. Chest CT, full body, 
I mean, we, we chose to do it because even though she was 17, we, we just couldn't get, come to why she was having such swinging temperatures. And um, Jerry, the answer lay in a humble ferritin. So this was done um, because when we saw the, uh, the hemoglobin was eight, and um, it was just why should somebody, is this just because she's unwell that her hemoglobin's eight? So as is known, we sent up a hematanics, not thinking why we were, and when it came up to over 70,000, um, I, I was completely stumped as to what to do. So does this help anybody with any differentials? So that's why I think your, your thought that you need to have multidisciplinary. So this is on, on uh, ongoing email exchanges with uh, my micro and virology colleagues. And he says, Neha, um, when you have such high ferritin, think of these three things. And that's uh, macrophage, macrophage activation syndrome, something I'd never heard of before, um, HLH, uh, hemorrhagic lymphocytosis, and adult onset Stills disease. So this time, then the heme oncologist, they all got very excited. The rheumatologist came into the picture. And then we had, um, uh, I remember we had a meeting with all these specialists to see what she was urgently, had a bone marrow with the hematology registrar driving up to do the bone marrow in our center. And the final diagnosis was this was adult onset Stills disease. She was given high dose steroids, managed with the rheumatology support, started on methotrexate, um, and um, she continued with her beta blockers. So this is two years follow up, her ferritin's now to 30, 35, her ventricle functions evolved, um, is near normal, and she has got very minimal fibrosis down in the basal uh, lateral wall. Um, so moving on to arrhythmias, um, so this patient was a 44-year-old, um, again, presented with classical ACS-like symptoms, with chest pain, um, no significant past medical history other than asthma. That's what his ECG. <laughs> he was brought in, cardioverted to sinus rhythm. Troponin was elevated. Young man, Asian, chest pain, coronary disease was a likely cause. He went on to have an angiogram. Um, and that was blameless. So the default would have been unexplained VT, go to EP, get an ICD, and off you go. Fortunately, um, Sam and I were involved, um, and we, he went on to have a CMR scan. And as um, you can see, you've got um, segments of um, hypertrophy that you can see, in, especially in the basal anteroseptal anterior wall, very focal. And if you compare this to the lateral wall, there is visible asymmetry. And if you could get these pictures by an echocardiogram, so in fact, that is how we were, we were involved because they said the echocardiogram shows um, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. Um, this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Do you want to get involved with his care? Um, so we put him in the scanner. And as some of the beautiful features of CMR are, uh, what we saw. So when we did this, um, we saw there was intense increase in signal in the areas of hypertrophy. So there was some injury going on there, and, um, and he had co-localized uh, segments of delayed gadolinium enhancement. Probably the extent is so much because of the ongoing edema circle. Now, um, if you look at these pictures, um, different pathologies come to, it could still be HCM, but when you think of, think beyond the box of uh, inherited cardiac conditions, and um, seem, uh, sarcoidosis is, um, is an entity that needs to be considered. Um, the sarcoid involves the heart. The commonest site of involvement of fibrosis is in the septal, basically the basal septal walls, moving on to your LV free wall, then your papillary muscles and your RV. And the reason RV comes last is because RV is so thin wall, you don't often see it very well. So our working diagnosis was sarcoid. So we went on to do a chest x-ray. The chest x-ray was blameless. Um, we spoke to our uh, pulmonologist and they said, um, okay, get a CT chest. Um, but this, the history doesn't sound that of sarcoid. Certainly we don't think lungs an issue. We got a CT done, the CT just showed some low volume lymph nodes, um, and the radiologists were not excited and said there's nothing to suggest sarcoid here. 
whilst all this was going on, um, we were assessing this patient, and that's his halter. So he had another cardiac arrest. Um, he had 51 minutes of both VT culminating into SARD, um, and he was shocked out of it with, um, uh, by the LAS, and um, we went on to do initially an RV, endomyocardial biopsy, that just showed edema. Uh, then um, we still needed to, because we were considering therapy, we were not getting any causes from there. We went on to do an LV biopsy, and again, that didn't show any um, specific inflammation. Um, this uh, was reviewed by, um, by the pathologist at our center, and I think we sent them across to you as well, Mike, but we couldn't really get anything out of it. Meanwhile, the viral teachers and cultures were negative. We did not, at this point, have um, any uh, resource to do viral PCR. You need to exclude TB in these patients um, because um, TB, if you're going to give, consider therapy for steroids, uh, with steroids, you make, make, make sure there's no an ongoing inflammation or infection. So with all that um, malignant presentation, uh, we thought this is sarcoidosis. We're going to start him on prednisolone and uh, that's how we carried on. We got <clears throat> the, uh, a formal respiratory review at this point. They went on to do a CT chest um, and a high-resolution CT, and they said, oh, yes, maybe there's some changes there. Maybe it could be sarcoid. However, the pulmonary function tests were completely normal. The transfer uh, factor was normal. Um, bloods were completely normal. And very reluctantly, they agreed uh, for a bronchoscopy. And that is what nailed it. And we found um, non caseating granulomas in, on bronchoscopy. And, um, and following that, the patient went on and had a dual chamber ICD. He, however, continued to have episodes of ventricle tachycardia. And we wanted to, um, this, he was only on steroids at the time, so we wanted to really quantify is there ongoing inflammation? Because his ICD was not MRI compatible, we could not put him in the MRI scanner. So we went on um, and got an FDG PET scan, and you can see there is increased uptake in the lateral wall. In keeping with his systemic symptoms, the PET CT findings, we started him on methotrexate, and six months post immunosuppression, the signal has completely reduced. And now he is over two years of, um, of, of therapy. He's off methotrexate. He's um, only on 2.5 uh, and off prednisolone, just being managed as standard heart failure in our clinic. Contrast this acute presentation with this uh, chronic presentation of a 38-year-old lady who presented to us with six months history of worsening shortness of breath. Uh, she was in NYHA class three to four. She gave sort of history of um, no chest pain, no palpitations, and no syncope. She was a diabetic, hypertensive, hyperlipidemia, and we thought, okay. Um, so that was her ECG, which shows, um, I'll let you decide what you think this is. Um, her chest x-ray shows a big, enlarged heart, uh, and that was her echo. So common garden, they thought, Asian lady, all the risk factors, that's her ECG, heart's gone. She's obviously got multivessel coronary artery disease. And uh, the, but she was stable, the troponin was not elevated, so she went into the MR scanner, and the MR scanner showed that the LV was severely uh, um, dilated and impaired. There was no edema, but the late gadolinium enhancement of tissue characterization shows um, patchy, um, sub-endocardial, sub-epicardial, late gadolinium enhancement, so quite extensive. And uh, the pattern of fibrosis seen here is a combination of both non-ischemic and ischemic causes. So when I say you can see transmural, and when you get transmural causes, you, you think about coronary disease. Um, when you get um, sub-epicardial, like you can see over here, you think about non-ischemic causes. So she warranted a coronary angiogram, and that was done, and that showed, again, normal um, unobstructed smooth coronaries. So what was the diagnosis here? So our empirical diagnosis here was this could be sarcoid. 
Um, so she went on to have a CT chest, and this time the CT chest shows okay, there are some changes consistent with sarcoidosis. The respiratory team came back and said, normal lung function, normal blood gases, they're not interested, she not, does not need anything from the respiratory view, so you can go and manage her as you want. Um, <clears throat> she, went, um, she continued to have increased ventricular ectopy, so we were wondering, um, can we start her on steroid or um, steroid sparing uh, immunosuppression? And, but we needed some data because she was troponin negative. The MR hadn't shown any activity um, on, um, on, of edema. The inflammatory markers were, were, were normal. So we got an FDG PET and this too did not show any active disease. However, what the FDG PET CT showed was um, these features would be consistent with uh, sarcoid lung disease. So on this note, uh, we uptitrated her heart failure medication. She went on to have a CRTD um, uh, implanted. And I'm pleased to say that this is now a year on and she's stable, not requiring any steroids or um, steroid sparing immunotherapy at present. Uh, moving on. Um, so I think it's just fair to spend a little bit of time on, on, on management of sarcoid. And the reason for that is the management of pulmonary sarcoid is quite well established. The British Thoracic Society guidelines and the World uh, Sarcoid and Other Granular Matters guidelines quite clearly state if you have symptoms uh, and or you have chest x-ray or other imaging and lung function findings, then you can start them on therapy. And the the most um, um, evidence-based therapy that we, that we have for that is <coughs> prednisolone. And um, following on from that, the second line of therapy, um, the steroid sparing, the most evidence-based, again from the respiratory literature, is on methotrexate. Um, things like azathioprine are used, but they have more side effects. And then you have other um, anti-TNF uh, antagonists that are also used, but they come way down. The lack of evidence um, inhibits their use in routine um, practice. So the commonest is steroids followed by methotrexate or a combination of the two. For cardiac sarcoid, it's much difficult. Uh, it's difficult because we can't diagnose that um, quite easily. Patients present with non-specific <coughs> symptoms, and the cardiac involvement, according to the series that we have, is very variable. Uh, certain series have only shown 2% of cardiac involvement in patients with systemic sarcoid, where others go up to 25%. Um, however, what they have shown is if you have cardiac sarcoid, then you do die. Uh, 25 to 80%, I think, is significant mortality uh, if you have this condition. The optimal management is, again, not well described. Um, so the commonest thing is steroids. What dose do you start on? How long do you continue steroids? And when do you start tapering? When do you introduce steroid sparing therapy um, and device therapy? How often should you monitor these patients? So the previous literature has been from the respiratory physicians, but more recently, the um, Heart Rhythm Society guidelines have given some more um, information. And again, um, this is quite a good read, the last, um, the last reference, and goes through different how you would manage therapy. But I think you, as a cardiologist, it's quite difficult to uh, initiate um, steroid therapy, how to, um, when to introduce steroid sparing therapy, how to monitor. Certainly, we are looking towards developing a partnership with our respiratory physicians who have much more experience, and the way forward is manage them in a joint setting. Um, what evidence is there um, whether steroids work in um, cardiac sarcoids? So I found this just one study, and you can see it's been published in CHEST. Maybe that's the reason we've never actually, I've never seen it before. Um, it's a very small study of about 12 patients who had cardiac involvement um, uh, alongside systemic sarcoid involvement. And the diagnosis of cardiac involvement was just based on CMR imaging. There was no histological diagnosis. And I'm led to believe by the uh, respiratory physicians that you know, if they've got somebody with sarcoid, they don't really push very hard for histology because the lung imaging is so uh, diagnostic. Uh, 
So um, in this study, they, start, they took this cohort of 12 patients, um, started steroids in, uh, in about three patients, and continued to image them at baseline six months and one year. And what they came out was that those of the three, um, so they had six and six, of the three patients that they gave steroids early, they did quite well, and the serial CMR scan showed that the changes had completely disappeared. And based on this very small study, they said, um, if you do suspect cardiac sarcoid and their ongoing symptoms, you should just start them on steroid treatment, and you need to um, do CMR imaging in all patients with systemic sarcoidosis for early disease recognition. And I think that is something, um, how we advocate that, um, that's, again, I think, for discussion. But it's not always easy. So I've shown so far all the cases we, we, we managed to um, find an etiology, treat the patient, and um, there was a management plan in place. Um, this was a difficult case. He's 22-year-old um, who presented with um, diagnosis of myopericarditis about nearly five years ago at another center. He was managed medically at the time and did really well. About uh, four years later, three years later, he again represented with systemic symptoms and continued to have multiple admissions with pericarditic sounding chest pain, but also had troponin elevation, which was not minimal, but significant at times. He'd had all drugs. He'd had been treated with standard heart failure drugs because his LV function initial presentation was around 45%. Because of his pericarditic signing chest pain, he was given colchicin, no response. Moving on to high-dose aspirin, again, didn't help. Methotrexate, again, symptoms continued despite methotrexate, so it was stopped. Then he was given high-dose steroids, continued them, and the weaning started. And as soon as the weaning started, he started having symptoms again. They also trialed him with azathioprine, uh, which he developed side effects from, and a Kindra, which is an interleukin uh, antagonist, he developed neutropenia, and that had to be stopped. So much so, he also had stellate ganglia block, but the symptoms still persisted. He was then referred on to us. Um, he'd had extensive investigations in his local hospital. Once presenting to us, we took help of our infection control, uh, infectious diseases, rheumatologist, and he had a host of just simple blood tests. Um, this time, the ferritin was normal. Uh, we went on to do lots of um, viral studies, um, autoimmune. Everything was negative. He went on then to have both an RV biopsy stage procedure. After that, an LV biopsy because the RV was inconclusive. Again, we were no wiser as to why he was having ongoing recurrent symptoms. Radiology help. He had extensive CT imaging, uh, no markers. And uh, we then went on to Leon, and he kindly arranged an FDG PET for this gentleman, which showed some mild uptick in the lateral wall. So we went on then to um, do another biopsy. Um, so this is, I'll show you in a minute, but that's his MRI scan, which um, shows extensive late gadolinium enhancement all across, almost circumferential manner of the myocardium. So he had then finally, a, he'd had an RV biopsy, an LV biopsy, and then after the FGD PET, he went to have a second LV biopsy. And the only thing that we came up, we reviewed this with uh, Mike Ash, and we found there's nothing significant, only mild non-specific inflammation. He also had a viral, extensive virology screen, um, and we were unable to identify um, anything on viral PCR. So the, the explanation was, we do not know. However, there is no ongoing signs of any viral inflammation. He then was commenced on mycophenolate as part of immunosuppression, but he still has ongoing symptoms. So it's not a success story, but that's the way we would have managed or we've managed our cohort. And you might just turn around and ask, what's the evidence for immunosuppression? Well, there are very few studies. I'll just take you through two. Uh, yeah, okay. So basically, this trial again showed that immunosuppression did not help. So that was a negative trial. A more recent was the TIMIC study, and that showed that there was evidence 
of improvement if you could exclude viral genomes and you get immunosuppression. In this study, they gave prednisolone and azathioprine. They felt um, there was almost an 80% improvement in the systolic function in patients received therapy. Um, one of the advantages of the study was that they used both LV and RV biopsy and they used advanced immunohistochemistry uh, um, um, uh, chemical imaging, which did help them exclude people with ongoing inflammation. So with this, um, I think that's the last slide. I'm just, um, something that Sam alluded to before, um, the key thing is in red here that management of these patients has to be done in an MDT setting. Um, it's very difficult. Um, some of them can be quite difficult in decisions and you just cannot have a but you do have a structure in your management plan as to how you would address these patients. Thank you very much.